And actually, I do think that you see more predictions on count data than you may realize, because every single time you go to a supermarket, there is some kind of prediction on count data underlying that, but I'll go into that in a second. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, for being here, for actually coming to my talk. I, I hope you'll stay until the end. So my context today is predicting large numbers of low count numerical target values. So prediction of classification, prediction count values, large numbers of those, possibly grouped. It's in parentheses, so it's like absolutely necessary. And of course, uh, is, this is motivated from where I come from. Retail sales at a store times stop keeping unit times day granularity. Very low granularity, and you need that for replenishment. So you need to know how much you're going to sell tomorrow because there's a promotion coming up. You need to know that in the store today so you can order. It's a little too late. You can find out later on to after tomorrow that you've sold a lot of products if you ran out of stock and your customers left the store without purchasing anything. So that's why you need it. And there's lots of other applications too. So I've seen some people around here from insurance companies. So if you're predicting insurance claim counts uh, for a single person, uh, you hope that there'll be a low count involved. Not a high count, but a low count over a year or something like that. And perhaps you want to group that by geography, by sex, by zip code, by anything else, by socioeconomic status, stuff like that, or any other uh, number of, of occurrences that are pretty rare, rare event occurrences. Uh, it could be in the time series forecasting context where I come from, or it could be somewhere else. So, the question is how do we assess whether such a prediction or forecast of that is any good? The first thing that comes to mind for people at forecasting is to look at point forecast accuracy measures like these here. There's a mean squared error, MSE, that just says, okay, we have a realization yi, and a forecast or a prediction yi hat. We take the square of the difference, sum it up, and divide by the number of occurrences that we have here. That's a mean squared error. And then we have the mean absolute error, which does essentially the same. It just doesn't have the square term up here. It just takes the absolute number. It's a mean absolute error. We can also do something like percentages, so you divide by the actual. Or you can do something like this here, take the sum of the absolute deviations and divide it by the sum of the actuals. And this turns out to be a weighted mean absolute percentage error. Or a mean absolute scale error, which is pretty common in the forecasting literature, maybe not so much common outside the forecasting people. OK, and now, before I really go close to sleep, I want you to do some work. Uh, who has the event app installed on a smartphone? Wonderful, lots of people. So please, pull up your app, go to the agenda, the, uh, tap on the top left, there's the, the menu, go to the agenda, select this talk, and then you see the Betragungen, top right, as a, as a tab, and you go there and you vote for your favorite point forecast accuracy measure. And I'll show you if this works out. Here we go. So, waiting. I'm waiting. Oh, wonderful. Things are happening. First vote, second vote. Wonderful. I was kind of afraid that everybody would just say, I don't do numerical predictions, in which case I would have asked you, why did you come to this talk for? But okay, three votes. Everybody takes an each right there. Oh, we do have some maid people here. One maid person. I'm not going to ask who's the maid person. Okay. Anybody else? Five votes? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Six votes. It's coming along. Okay, wonderful. So these are essentially the kinds of parameters that you see in forecasting, and Sven Conan knows all about this here, and lots of other people know, also know a lot about this here. And I'm going to talk a little about these point forecast accuracy measurements and about other things. So I may be preaching to the choir here if everybody needs uses mean squared error, which is wonderful. Okay, I'll perhaps we can look on at this a little later on. Let's just continue for now. Okay, so all these, all these wonderful error measures have advantages and disadvantages, and I'm not going to go in deep detail through all these different uh, advantages and disadvantages. One thing here for the mean squared error is if you look at time series, and you have many time series from many different, for instance, products that sell in a store, you have fast moving products, slow moving products, and if you want to compare the mean squared error between a fast moving and a slow moving product, then you're kind of out of luck, because a mean squared error of 10 uh, can be very good for milk, which is a very fast moving item, and it can be terrible for a particular type of shampoo, which is a very slow moving product. So in cases like that, you're kind of uh, 
course, you use something like a percentage error, any kind that is more or less comparable, but that has different problems here. It's also more intuitive, so once you talk to non-data scientists, uh, the managers that actually sign your paycheck, uh, they understand percentages rather well. Uh, they don't really understand the squared bottles of shampoo and stuff like that. So the mean spread error has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. And uh, it turns out that optimizing on some of these point forecast accuracy measures can lead to systematically biased predictions, especially in our low volume count data situation here. And it's better to predict and assess full densities, full predicted densities, and that's what I'm going to make a little uh, advertisements for here. Actually, this is going to be my first part, how mean absolute error and stuff like that can lead you to predict and to bias predictions. And the second part will be how to assess full predicted discrete densities. There is a full paper on this that's recently been published. Okay, let's go into part one. Optimizing certain point forecast accuracy measures can lead to biased predictions. Maybe may not be new to you. It was new to a lot of forecasters, I think, looking at the literature. If you have any probability distribution, any distribution whatsoever, if you want to summarize that by a single functional of the distribution, there's different ways you can do that. You can summarize a probability distribution by its mean, for instance. And then, that's part of what you learn in your statistics classes. The mean, the expectation of a probability distribution, minimizes the expected squared error. So just uh, integrate over the error, so the square error, you get the minimum if you predict the mean. And if you take the median, that one minimizes a different function. It minimizes the expected absolute error. And that's usually not taught in introductory statistics courses, although there is a very, very nice visualization of why that is so. It's a wonderful paper in the American Statistician, very recommended. So if we translate that into forecasting, predicting, if you have an idea about your future distribution, if you assume your future distribution will be Poisson distributed with a mean of 0.5 or something like that, if that's what you assume your future sales, claim counts, whatever it should be, then if your bonus depends on minimizing the MSE, you predict the mean, predict 0.5. If your bonus depends on minimizing the expected mean absolute error or mean absolute deviation, you don't predict the expectation, you predict the median. That can be a very diff different thing for count data, which are usually asymmetric. Or turning it around, if you optimize your forecast method or your parameters or whatever it is to minimize the mean absolute error and the future distribution is skewed and not symmetric, then your forecast will be biased. You will systematically under or over forecast. And this actually looks rather trivial, essentially is. But I looked at lots of papers about intermittent demand forecasting. There's lots of people who work on that. And most of them were very surprised that the very best method for forecasting intermittent demand was a flat zero forecast. So that was exactly what's happening here, because they were operationalizing best in terms of MAE, or some other error measure that was simply optimized by the median. And the median for an intermittent demand time series is often zero. If more than half of your realizations is zero, and the median of your future take of the future distribution is zero, assuming stationarity. And then so the zero forecast was the best, and people had to bend over backwards to justify why they still like their, their favorite method better than the zero flat line forecast. Well, I understand why you'd rather have a non-zero forecast, but it just didn't work with their MAE. Yeah, that also applies to lots of other error measures like this scale error or the way it made with a simply scale of multiples of the MAE. And just a, just a little example here, if you have a Poisson time series or a count or whatever in the future and you want to forecast something that is distributed like this is just a, a simulated realization of a Poisson 0.5 process or a Poisson 0.3 process, I can look like this here, or a Poisson 0.6 process or something like that. In each of these cases, if you want to minimize the expected mean after the error, you forecast a flat zero. And if you want to forecast to minimize the expected mean squared error, you forecast the expectation, of course. So, and of course, I'd say that for something like this, a flat zero forecast probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And very much then, uh, this really has kind of implications for, for how to set the performance measures for forecasters. So, I don't know if you use an AE if you have 
Okay, we're moving on to part two now. Uh, we've seen that point forecast, uh, point forecasts are not always useful. Here's another example. These are just three different time series simulated. All of them have the same expectation of two. The middle one is a Poisson. This one is a negative binomial, and that one is a binomial, so non-negative binomial. In each case, the mean would be a two, which is wonderful. So your point forecast, if you want to go for a point forecast, you forecast two. If you want an unbiased forecast, that's wonderful. But then, well, you look at things here, and you say, okay, a point forecast is two. That's the optimal point forecast on a squared loss. That's wonderful, but that's not help me. So if this here is your future sales in your supermarket or whatever else, a forecast of two is wonderful, but most actual demands are far lower, and there's demands that go up to 18 or something like that, so how much does that have to do with a flat line of two? Or, and it's more important, it's wildly different from here where all the realizations are three or lower, so does a point forecast really help us? It doesn't help us for setting safety demands, for scenario planning, for any kind of sensitivity analysis or stuff like that. So for anything, I would argue that for most uses, for most actual, uh, for most use cases that actually consume a forecast, you shouldn't aim for a point forecast, or a point forecast and measure of variance, which is better, but still not good enough. I'd say we need to forecast a full predictive density. We need to forecast a full future density, and when we forecast it, it's predictive density. Wonderful. Okay, so that's what we want to do. How do we assess whether what we're doing is good or not? We have a predictive density. We want to forecast, we say, okay, this year we forecast a Poisson distribution with a correct parameter. How do we find out that that's actually the correct density? And if we forecast a Poisson distribution for this person here, for this time series, how do we find out that that is actually not correct? There's a couple of tools that have been developed for this. And I'm actually not talking about lots of very new things here. This is a probability integral transformation, the PIT. That's not my brainchild. That's been used for a long time in finance and macroeconomics where people have routinely forecasted full predictive distributions. Usually normal distributions, uh, then they found out the hard way that the normal distribution doesn't really work because it's uh, real financial returns are fat-tailed. And so after a crash a couple of years back, the fat-tailed distributions became a little more, more on vogue. How does this work? Well, suppose we have some kind of future density, forecasted density at t, so at a time t, or it could be if it's not time order, if it's just order, then we could have an fi, it doesn't matter, and a cumulative distribution function f hat t, capital f hat t, so this covers the case that we might have different distributions for different times, points in time. Then just take the actual observation that belongs to this time point, as follows, well, it's a simple distribution, it's a simple transformation. You just take the your predicted probability that your actual realization would be lower than the, the realization you actually saw. Well, that's a fancy way of saying you just evaluate the cumulative distribution function, the forecasted CDF at this point. And this is yet another variant of writing this. Why? Well, if you think about this a little and think back to your introductory statistics classes, that means that if you actually have the correct distribution function for the future, if, if, if your predicted density is the correct density, then these PTs here will be uniformly distributed between 0 and 1, because that's just a reformulation of the definition of the CDF hat. And then, well, you have a lot of, lots of Ps here, as I said, you have large numbers of realizations, and you want to see whether these are uniformly distributed. Well, you can test them. There is lots of literature on testing uniformity. Often people do the roundabout way and transform it into a normal distribution, then test normal distribution. I don't like that. Uh, but this, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. There's different ways of doing this. So for instance, if we have an, a log normal distribution like this here, there's a the density just turned sideways for the log normal distribution. There's a just 500 realizations to see how they're skewed. And if we run through this process here, and in each case have a predictive density that is log normal and correctly specified, and run through the, and get this pit here, this probability integral transform, and you get a histogram, and that is reasonably uniform. It can be uniformer if you get more samples. That's wonderful, right? 
wonderful. It's so wonderful that it's been used for 20 years or something like that in the finance literature. Everybody there uses this. It's wonderful. Much less used in, in supply chain or other forecasting approaches. And why? Well, we have one problem with discrete predictive distributions. So if we have a discrete predictive distribution, there's just a simple Poisson down here, right? and there's the realizations, and that's the kind of demands you might observe in the supermarket, lots of zeros, and you might observe ones and twos and sometimes a 10, but you don't observe sales of 2.3 bottles of shampoo, nor do you observe sales of minus 1.7 uh, whatever else. So you see these predictive distributions. If we run through the same exercise here, we have the correct future density. If we have them correct, if we actually do have Poisson distributed sales, and we know that we have Poisson distributed sales, and we run through this here, well, what will come out? Well, there's only a discrete set of PTs that can happen. But if we see a zero, then we the PT is just the probability of observing a zero in this Poisson distribution. That's just a number, one number. If we see a one, the PT is a probability of observing less than one, or one or one or fewer units. If we see two, it's not supported. It's just the PTs in a stationary distribution will be discrete. And they will certainly not be uniform, right? So all our wonderful theory here of getting a uniform histogram of PTs, it doesn't work anymore. We get something like this here. This is the, the P, this is a transformation. This transformation for the correctly specified distribution, and it's anything but work. So this doesn't work in the discrete case. Okay, so what do we do? Well, fortunately, there's a smart idea. I can call that a smart idea because it's not my idea. Actually, it was my idea, and I was completely, uh, I, was, I, was, I was amazed that someone like this, a wonderful, nice, wonderful idea, wrote up a manuscript, circulated it, lots of other people found it wonderful, and then one person, Tim McKnighty, uh, wrote back that he found it a wonderful idea, and it was so wonderful that uh, at least three other people had independently found it before. It looks like every 10 years somebody rediscovers the same thing. Right? I just came along in 2015, so it's like a quadratic cycle, right? Of the randomized pit. Well, the idea is very simple. If we observe a zero in our sales, and we know in our Poisson predictive distribution that the probability for a zero is whatever, say, 0.9, then we don't just write down a point 0.9 and we draw a random number between 0 and point 0.9. If we observe a 1, then the probability for a 1 in our predictive distribution, in our Poisson, maybe 0.95, then we just draw a uniform PT between point 0.9 and point 0.95, and so on. It's just a randomization of it. And that takes care of smearing out this big bump to everything over there, and smearing out this bump to everything over there, and so on and so forth. And again, same thinking if we have the correct future predictive distribution, then again, these ran randomized picks will lead to a PT that is uniform on zero one. Oh, again, we can start testing. Okay, so here's a little example here. There's a Poisson distribution on the left and a negative distribution on the right. They both have a mean of 0.4. So that means that the 0.4 test minimizing the MAE would again be zero. So it's a classical case where this problem would, uh, would occur. And then we have two different hypotheses. One is correct. We hypothesize a Poisson 0.4. That works for this one. It doesn't work for this one. Or we have a hypothesis that these are NECBIN 0.4.2. That works for this one. Doesn't work for that one. And these are just the randomized keys that we get out of this here. This here, correctly specified Poisson distribution of essentially uniform PTs, correctly <coughs> specified NECBIN, essentially uniform PTs. Wonderful. And if we assume that our NECBIN is going to be Poisson distributed, so we have a misspecified future density, then we get something like this, which has a big hole here, and then it bumps up again here, so this is really not uniformly distributed. And if we assume that our true Poisson is negative binomial distributed, then we get something like this and sharp peak up here, and then we can run any kind of statistical tests, and I just took some smooth tests for uniform, uniformity, data-driven, uh, PJ and Davina, 
you'll see a test statistic, WT, and a p-value for the test statistic. And there you see we can reject normal uniformity in these two cases and we don't reject them here. So it does seem to work. Okay, wonderful. And how do we apply this to group data? That is multiple time series, for instance, or claims counts that are uh, grouped by, by geography, by zip code, by something else. Well, there's different ways and um, simple ways here. One possibility would be take all the p-values out of this randomized pit for all the different time series, for all groups, for all entries in all groups. And then we have one giant vector of p's, and then we can test that one for uniformity and start visualizing. Or take the each groups, each series p-values, test them for uniformity. Then we get a test statistic for each series, and then we can start plotting and summarizing and comparing these. Both are possible ways of going about this and uh, adding um, and giving some, some information about what works and what doesn't work. So here's a little illustration of this for two data sets. As I said, I come from retail forecasters. So I took two data sets with daily sales one supermarket each for from one, two different European group retailers to a thousand series each and forecast up to 100 days ahead for each series. And that tracked different forecasting approaches and I used some from the 80s, right? So not the 50s and 60s that we just learned, heard about. Um, actually, this is home growth. There's a very simple uh, idea. Well, the idea point is here, we really need, we need density forecasts and the problem is, of course, that Many of these standard forecasting techniques, exponential smoothing, don't really necessarily have an underlying uh, statistical model, though well, they mostly do, but it's usually not implemented, so it's hard to get something that actually works, gives us a density forecast for discrete data. There are integer uh, autoregressive models that may or may not work, but are not very common. I just went with some very simple approaches. It's empirical plus weekday, I call this, and it's just we have a density, we want a density forecast for next Friday's sales. Well, just take all historical Fridays and look at their sales and look at their distribution. And that's the density, that's the probability mass function for the next Friday. Same for next Saturday, same for next Monday. Empirical in terms of just it's completely non-model based. It just takes the corresponding weekday and looks at what we've observed empirically. Another forecasting approach will be plus sound regression for a negative regression, because these, well, yeah, including day of week, price, trend, Christmas, because we know that these have an impact here. Yes, it does have a, a linear impact on, on price that goes uh, through, the, through the link function, so it turn, gets turned on the near in between. And these give us density forecasts. Of course, once you start including parameter uncertainty, the true forecast, the true density would not be Poisson anymore, it would be over dispersed, but I didn't look at that. In this context, I did look at a, at, in the paper I looked at many other approaches, in, for instance, bootstrapping these to account for the over dispersion that comes from parameters in uncertainty, so it just doesn't make a lot of difference. And these are the results then. Retailer A, retailer B. At the top, we see histograms of these RPIT p values for empirical plus weak phase for Poisson regression for Mechner regression, the same on the right for the other retailer. Let's start with that here. What do we see here? Well, let's look at Poisson regression first. We see this, we see a histogram that's kind of U shaped. We see, and the flat line, that's where uniformity should appear, right? Uh, anything that's close to the flat line is uniform, and that's wonderful. And this is not close to uniform, that is not. We see lots of p-values here to the left, and very many p-values at the very right. What does that mean? That means that we have seen many sales that are far below what we expect. They're very, they're, uh, they're very low compared to what we expect. So the left end of our predictive distribution is overrepresented, and similarly, the right end of our predictive distribution is overrepresented in the actuals. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't capture, a sound regression doesn't capture the order dispersion. More low sales and more high sales than we expect, given our Poisson assumption, so <coughs> doesn't make sense for these supermarket sale, sales here, and it's the very same picture for retailer B. So these are two completely different retailers. One is a drugstore, the other one is a grocery. So, and in, e in either case, it doesn't make sense to use a Poisson regression. 
the empirical plus weak phase and the neck pin regression, they perform better. Neck pin over here and plus empirical over here still have a hump at the very low levels. They both have humps at the high levels here, right? But at least for this retail idea, we have captured with the empirical plus weak phase or the neck pin, we've captured the low levels, uh, the low end rather well. And we always underestimate the incidence of the very high sales for any of these here, right? The probability for high sales is always under forecast. And we see that in this randomized pit here. And down here, well, I have subjected each time series to this data-driven smooth test, and then just plotted the WT test statistics, and you see how the test statistics lower is better for empirical plus weak days, and neck pin regression are lower than for sound regression. And this is actually quite a difference here because of the logarithmic scale. And that just, again, shows, reinforces that Massan regression doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah, as I said in the paper, I looked at about 15 different, 12 or 15 different approaches. So I originally looked at 13, then one uh, reviewer suggested adding another two, so I kind of know who that, who that reviewer was. So I added them, they didn't perform rather well. And it always, it's, the summary really is that this empirical plus weekday set doesn't even include uh, prices and stuff like that, or seasonality or anything else, just the day of week, but that is incredibly good and incredibly hard to beat. So yes, smart new technologies from the 2000s and 2010s and non-linearities may be, may be useful, but uh, to a degree, very simple approaches, very, very easy approaches might be actually rather, work rather well. Okay, and actually, I'm well in time, that's a conclusion. My conclusion is don't rely on the mean absolute error and similar things to get an unbiased point forecast, especially if you have point if you have count time series or anything else where you expect uh, large values and low and uh, small values to be differentially represented if you have asymmetric data, don't look at the MAE. If you do need to report them, mean absolute error, MAPES, uh, percentage errors and to sometimes have to report them because people want to know them because people, as I said, are more comfortable with the way it made. Well, then at least also report whether you have bias. If you have a prime prediction, it's probably better to use MSE, which many here are using, whether root mean square error or scaled version or something else. But I'd say, I would argue, it's better to forecast full predictive densities and then assess them in some way, as we did here, for instance, and there's an alternative to the R pit, and that's also the other part of the paper, which is proper scoring rules. Uh, scoring rule, I have a lot of time left, I actually have to slide on these, but I'm not going to do that to you. A scoring rule, the, the idea is it's a function that takes a predictive density and a realization that maps these to a score. And you do that for many realizations and their corresponding predictive densities, you get many scores, and you average them. And the proper scoring rule is one that is minimized in expectation if your predictive density is correct. And there's a couple of these that have been developed. They're more common again in the <coughs> continuous context, but there are some of these that actually work for the discrete context. So you can use these. And they paint actually the same picture than as we saw here in the paper. They just don't show these wonderful uh, histograms up here, and these are actually easier to interpret and easier to understand. So that's why I didn't talk about the proper scoring rules, although they are slightly more sophisticated, but then again, slightly harder to understand. And of course, the problem here is all of these, both proper scoring rules and the R pit, they only look at marginals, right? They don't look at any correlations between errors. And if we're looking at daily data here, it's uh, immediate to, to think uh, about if we have a problem here with uh, remaining weak day patterns here. If we have seasonality and if something goes up and we should see some kind of remaining seasonality on a lag of seven or something like that. Well, that would be also something you could look at. And there's a couple of papers that do something similar, again, in the, in the non-discrete case uh, by doing market chain alternatives and seeing how the errors compare with them, whether there's remaining autoregressive or other structures, uh, that is extremely hard for low counts because there's simply very little power involved here. If in a drugstore uh, for a typical product you sell one per day, perhaps or even lower, then whether you sell two on two consecutive Saturdays doesn't really mean a lot. There's just a lot of sampling and variation in there. So it's extremely hard to do that for low counts. There's very little power involved here. And finally, I'd say that 
uh, full predictive densities are important, and probably more important than point forecasts. The problem is most people only understand point forecasts, and that's what they understand as the forecast. I'd say the forecast should be a full predictive density. But finally, what they should really do is assess the consequences of the forecast. So here you have a point forecast or a predictive density or whatever. It's not the end of the story. You take the forecast and prediction and do something with that. Uh, if you do credit scoring, well, you do something with that. You give the guy a load or you don't. And then you should really look at, well, uh, did that perform well? Is my, is my profit going up or down? And in supermarket sales forecasting, the question is, how much stock do I have and how much out of stocks do I have? Stuff like that. So you should really look at the consequences of the forecast, cost of forecast error or forecast value added or just some some uh, tags that you can that you find in the literature on this year. And these should will usually include interval forecasts for predictive densities, because you need some kind of safety around often, and subsequent processes like logistical optimization for replenishment. And uh, just a little uh, answer to Sven's talk, uh, the last talk here, why do people keep on using simple methods? Uh, I've often seen in my uh, in my experience that smarter methods, uh, newer methods may be more accurate, but once you look at the subsequent processes, for instance in supermarket retailing and supermarket forecasting replenishment, if you have sales of four tomorrow, and you have a forecast of six and a forecast of five, and of course a forecast of five is more accurate, wonderful. But if you can only push product into the store in multiples of eight, because that's a logistical unit, then it doesn't make much of a difference whether I use a smart method that has a forecast of five or a dumb unit that has a forecast of six, or even a dumbest unit a forecast that has a forecast of one unit. And that's something that I see often and that may with agile supply chains change in the future, which makes it even more important to actually look at not only the forecast, but at the consequences of the forecast. And I see that I only have five minutes left, so no, I'm not going to read to you the entire <laughs> Okay, uh, I couldn't resist to plug my book. Uh, just came out a month ago, Demand Forecasting for Managers. So if you work for somebody and do forecasting for him and he doesn't understand his forecasting, give him this book. It's inexpensive, it's easy to, I always like to say it's less expensive than a good bottle of wine. It reads about as quickly as a good bottle of wine is consumed and it doesn't give you a headache afterwards. So there's a price outside. Thank you very much.